This morning, would you join me as we continue our study through Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 2? If you have a Bible, join me in Mark chapter 2. And actually, the pericope that we'll read from today takes the, the passage through chapter 2 and into chapter 3. So we, we will read the conclusion of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. If you're visiting with us today and you're, you just walked in, you're like, why are we here? Um, we preach straight, try to preach straight through large texts of the Bible, and we are currently walking our way through Mark's gospel throughout this calendar year, and, and then probably more after the calendar year, because at the pace we're going, we're not probably not going to get through it. But Mark chapter 2 this morning, while you're finding your way there, in 2005, there was a country music song written by two men named Adam Dorsey and Mark Narmore. The song spent four weeks at number one on the charts and was declared by some in 2005 to be the number one country song of that entire calendar year. Country music star Craig Morgan recorded the song entitled, That's What I Love About Sunday. The entire song is based around three things, a Sunday filled with worship, rest, and love. Far too many of us have made Sunday a day of hectic, hurried, stressful, overbearing busyness, and just overall burdensome. It would do us all some spiritual, physical, and mental good this morning to get back to allowing Sunday to truly be a day like the country music song inspired, a day of worship, rest, and love. As Christians, we must not think ourselves to be more important than God by deeming that we don't have time nor the need for a day of true worshipful rest. If God the creator and sustainer of the entire universe saw fit to take a day of rest from the work of his creation, then we too should practice the routine discipline of observing a Sabbath rest. The American dream has caused so many of us to live in such a hurried rat race, to live in such a frenzied lifestyle, to run at such hectic and breakneck speeds that the very idea of a day of rest can be scoffed at in our culture and oftentimes in the church as well. Sometimes the church is guilty of filling their calendars, so much so the church doesn't even begin to be worshipful or restful anymore. It becomes a burden with all that needs to be done. As your preacher, I would like to go on the record today as saying this. The Sabbath and our celebration on Sunday should be the most joyful day of the week. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, and Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, is going to deal with the subject of Sunday, or the Sabbath. And he's going to deal with it in two issues, which leads us to today's text and the title of this morning's sermon, What Do We Do With Sunday? What do we do with Sunday? You want to stand with me as we read the scriptures this morning? Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, and Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's begin reading in verse 23. It says, Now it happened that Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, except for the priests. And he gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Chapter 3. And Jesus then entered the synagogue. And again, there was a man there who had a withered hand. And so they watched him closely to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. He said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill it? But they all kept silence. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. 
He stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored as whole as the other one. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Jesus of how they might destroy him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we confess to you this morning that we need your help to understand a Sabbath rest. Help us to remember the Sabbath and to have joy in it. May this day bring a weekly refreshment and renewal to our souls, as well as a reminder to us of your kindness. May the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, the hearing of your word, and our obedience to your word be observed today in our public worship. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. There was a man who made his living chopping wood. He believed he could chop more wood than anybody he knew. And he knew another man who chopped wood for a living, and he challenged him and said, I believe that I can chop more wood in a day's work than you can. And the other fellow said, I'll take you up on that challenge. So they set the day and they set the time, and they arrived and they began to chop wood. And the man who set up the challenge, he began to swing his axe as fast and as furious as he possibly could. After about an hour of swinging that axe and chopping wood, he looked over at the other man, and after about an hour, he was taking a break. That fellow said, I knew I could beat him. There's no way he can chop more wood than me. After two hours, he looked over again. The man's taking a break again. He's like, there's no possible way he's going to win this. So the man continued to chop wood all the way up until lunchtime. Then at lunchtime, he thought, I need to take a quick bite, get a quick sandwich, and come right back to chopping wood because there's no way I'm going to let this man chop more wood than me. So he took him a five, ten-minute lunch break and hurried back to continue chopping wood. Looked over and the man took an hour-long lunch break. He began to chop wood. Now one o'clock rolls around. The man's taking a break. Two o'clock rolls around. The man takes another break. This guy keeps swinging his axe. Three o'clock rolls around. Another break. Four o'clock, another. Five o'clock. And finally it's quitting time. And this fella knows, I've chopped way more wood than this guy. And they begin to add up their piles and weigh it to see who has chopped the most wood, only to find out the man who took all these breaks has chopped infinitely more wood than the other man. And this guy's confused. He's like, how is this possible? I have worked all day. I have not stopped except for about 10 minutes to grab lunch. And you've stopped every single hour. How is this possible that you have chopped more wood than me? And the guy looked up at him and he said, all you saw was me taking a break. But what you failed to see was that during that time, I was sharpening my axe. A Sabbath day's rest is not laziness. It is sharpening your spiritual axe. The Sabbath brings with it many questions. Almost every Christian at some point in time has considered what can and cannot be done on Sunday. Any true follower of Christ will at some point wrestle with the question or at minimum consider their actions as worthy of the Sabbath or as wrongfully lending to another tiresome day of work. Every Christian will eventually ask, is it wrong for me to do this or is it acceptable for me to do this? Should I do that? Should I not do this? What can I do and what can I do on the Sabbath day's rest? Many hold to a very burdensome and legalistic view of Sunday, while others view it through a very grace-filled lens. The question that surrounds the Sabbath are many. Let me ask you a few this morning. Is it wrong to go for a walk on Sunday afternoon? Is it wrong to go to the lake on Sunday evening? Is it wrong to take an autumn drive to the mountains when it's beautiful on Sunday afternoon? Is it wrong to cook on Sunday to do the dishes on Sunday or to do the laundry on Sunday. These are all honest questions whose answers are not explicitly laid out for us in Scripture. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say, church. When the Scriptures are silent, we must offer grace. When the Scriptures are clear, we must not waver. The Bible is clear about one thing in regards to the Sabbath, that is, that it should be a day of rest and remembrance to the Lord. Where the Bible is silent and its exact logistics of how that plays out is somewhat different for each person. Is Sunday exclusively a day for me to simply stay in bed all day to prove my rest to God or flip that coin? 
Am I standing condemned in any judgment if I engage in actions considered to be work on Sunday? What about jobs of necessity? Are they in violation of breaking the Sabbath? Should EMT workers, policemen, and firemen, and the like refuse serving you because it's the Sabbath? My guess is if your house was on fire, you probably don't want them saying, wait till Monday. What about the single mom who's struggling to make ends meet and keep her head above water? Whose husband walked out on her and her job is offering extra shifts and she needs the money to make ends meet and those shifts arrive on Saturday and Sunday. Should she take them or would this anger God as breaking the Sabbath? What if our family takes a vacation and we don't attend church on that Sunday in whatever town or country we're visiting? Is that breaking the Sabbath? These are all legitimate questions that many people have wrestled with and deal with. Even the religious leaders of Jesus' day dealt with these questions. And they struggled to fully understand and answer all the questions that surround a Sabbath day's rest. The religious leaders of Jesus' day fought very, very hard for the Sabbath to be legalistic and it never became enjoyable for them. When Jesus came along, he said, the Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. I didn't put you on this earth to try to make sure you follow all these rules on the Sabbath. No, no, no. I give you the Sabbath for your rest. Some may ask, if Sunday is to be honored and observed as the Lord's Day, then why didn't God give us more detailed New Testament specifics about what we can and cannot do in observance of the Sabbath? The questions that surround the Sabbath in our culture are many. And they're not always the easiest to answer. So I hope on this Sunday to put Sunday into some biblical perspective for you. First question I have for you is, why Sunday? Isn't the seventh day of the week Saturday? So why do we worship on Sunday? Well, when Jesus came on the scene and was crucified and dead and buried and resurrected, he said that he brings to us a new covenant, a covenant that is grace-filled and celebratory. It is a covenant of his resurrection. And on the first day of the week, the early church gathered for prayer and gathered for worship. It was on the first day of the week that Jesus rose from the dead. It was on the first day of the week that the day of Pentecost fell. It was on the first day of the week that we continually see the early church gathering to worship. Not in disobedience to breaking a seventh day Saturday Sabbath, but they do it worshipfully to engage in the new covenant that Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday. A close reading of Scripture will lead one to understand two issues play out. You'll see in the New Testament, Jesus and his followers seem to enjoy the Sabbath, but the religious leaders seem to be burdened by it. That was never God's intent with the Sabbath. He never gave you Sunday to be burdened by it. He gave it to you for a day of rest. At no point does Jesus ever seem to indicate that the Sabbath should be a day of stressful, worryful, religious regulations that must be adhered to, but rather it should be a day of worshipful, joyful rest. Sabbath rules have often caused many people to live in one of two extremes. The extreme that I can absolutely do nothing or the extreme that I can just do anything. So the question I have on the table today is what do we do with Sunday? Main point I want you to see of the text this morning. The Sabbath was given to man for him to worship joyfully and rest peacefully. The Sabbath was given to man for him to worship joyfully and rest peacefully. The church has often taken on this American philosophy when it comes to church life. And in America, we believe that we are successful if our calendars are full. We believe that we have a lot going on if our calendars are filled, so much so that we're running in every direction. And many times the church makes this same mistake by believing that if we can fill up your calendar all day on Sunday, that we can keep you here for hours on end, then somehow we have proven our worship to God, when in reality we may actually be burdening you and not allowing you the freedom to worship and rest peacefully. We observe the Sabbath because we belong to God. We do not belong to God because we observe the Sabbath. Do I need to say that to you again? The Sabbath was not given to man to burden him with overly strict rules on how he should and should not rest. 
Let me tell you, there's a difference in rest in my household. I'm going to tell you how it works out. My wife's way of resting is not my way of resting. There has been many Sunday afternoons that she will say to me, Hey, Jeremy, let's drive down to Lincolnton and go walk the rail trail. And I'll say, Woman, I want to sit right on this couch. I want to eat these Reese's and watch this football game. She'll say, Let's go down to West Lincoln Park and let's walk. Let's go over to Northbrook at the track and let's, let's walk. Let's go outside and enjoy the sunshine. Let's just, I'm like, no, I want to enjoy the couch. There's two things that I believe Sunday should do. It should be a day of public worship and personal rest. To put it in layman's terms, on Sunday we should attend the church and enjoy the couch. <laughs> But I also understand that not everybody rests in the same way. And what is restful for one man may not be restful for another man. And what is restful for one family may not be restful for another family. This is why the Sabbath was given to man for his rest and his enjoyment, not man for the Sabbath. When the disciples plucked heads of grain, they didn't consider it work. They needed a snack as they walked along. The Pharisees looked at them and said, you can't grab that. Grabbing that is work. And the disciple says, it's not work for us. It's enjoyment for us. And then Jesus had to step in and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And he uses this example in, chapter, in verses 23 through 28 of King David. And he speaks of King David. And he says, do you not remember, Pharisees, what King David did? He actually went into the, to the temple on the Sabbath, took the priest's bread, ate it, which was not lawful for him to do, and gave it to his people. And now my disciples have plucked a, grain, a head of grain, and you seem to have a problem with them, but not a problem with them. Do you see the hypocrisy there? They would scream that his disciples are doing things wrong while they would ignore their own hypocrisy of what was happening on their own Sabbath. Jesus made this very clear. The strict, rule-based observance of the Sabbath is not where one finds hope and peace with God. But because one has hope and peace with God, they can enjoy the Sabbath. We observe the Sabbath not to try to be made right with God, but we observe the Sabbath because we've been made right with God. In the Bible, the word Sabbath, you probably think of it as rest or Sunday or a day to gather with God's people. But in the original Old Testament Hebrew language, the word itself meant intermission. You ever been to a play that had an intermission? You ever been to a recital that had an intermission? Some of y'all thinking, I wish your sermon had an intermission. You ever been to a football game to have a halftime? Why? The players need a break. The, the actors on stage need a break. The people in the audience can't watch nonstop. They need a break. When it's a basketball game, have intermission at quarters, and then a long halftime, they need a break. Why does baseball have a seventh inning stretch? They need a break. A.W. Pink said it like this. He said, I learned since childhood that there's a direct correlation between how I spend my time on the Lord's day and my enjoyment of the week to come. Listen to me, church. No one in this room who claims the name of Jesus can survive and thrive and continue along effectively in their Christian journey without observance of a day of rest. God did not design us to go nonstop. He didn't design us that way. I don't care how important your job is or your hobbies are or whatever, we all need a day of rest we all need to, to rest from, from time to time. We need that Sabbath. And if you say, I don't have time for a Sabbath, Pastor. You don't know how much I got going on in my life. Some things need to be rearranged if you can't. Why? Because essentially, here's what you're saying. And listen carefully to this. Essentially, if you say to me, Pastor, I don't need a Sabbath day's rest. My family doesn't need a Sabbath day's rest. I got too much to do, too many places to go, and we got too much going on. To believe that is to believe that you are better at what you do than God was at what he did. And I'm pretty sure you're not. Let me say it again. To believe you don't need a Sabbath 
is to believe you're better at your work than God was at his work. Let's look at the text this morning, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 deals with two issues on the Sabbath. The first issue is did Jesus' disciples break the Sabbath by plucking heads of grain? Issue number two was did Jesus himself break the Sabbath by healing a man in church? Let's look at number one. Number one begs the question of what is work on the Sabbath? In verses 23 through 28, we see what just happened with those disciples walking along and how the Pharisees said, you can't pluck that. That's work. And the disciples says, no, it's not. For us, it's just a snack. Jesus' disciples plucked those heads of grain and ate them on Sunday. And this caused those religious leaders to be up in arms because they viewed it as work. Not everyone sees things the same way. What may be work for one is not necessarily for another. What may be soul refreshment for one is not soul refreshment for another. Jesus then shows those religious zealots the error of their way with the, with the example of King David, as I just showed you. Basically, they didn't do things, or basically they did things one way, and then they wanted Jesus' disciples to do them their way. We must be careful, church, that we do not become hypocrites when it comes to our observance of the Sabbath funny story when my mom and dad had become Christians I was a teenager and I was of driving age and I had a little Honda that I drove through high school and one Sunday I told mom I said uh, I said mom I'm this whole Christianity thing at this point is just it's still foreign to me I said mom I'm gonna go wash my car and she said no you're not I said mom it's just a little Honda it'll, it'll take me 30 minutes I'm gonna go wash my car I'll be back in a little bit she said no you're not son and we have laughed about this story for many, many years, or we did laugh about it for many years. I said, Mom, why can I not wash my car? It's literally going to take me 30 minutes. And she said, because it's Sunday, son, and you're not washing your car on Sunday. I said, well, what's that got to do with anything? Why can't I wash my car on Sunday? And she said, because the neighbors will see you. And I said, well, you're washing clothes. She said, the neighbors can't see me. <laughs> we need to be careful that we're not hypocrites when it comes to the Sabbath. God gave you the Sabbath for your day of rest. I encourage you to enjoy your day of rest. The Pharisees were fine with King David's method of eating, but they weren't fine with Jesus' disciples' method of eating. Let us remember that the Sabbath was given for us to rest. And how we rest may not be how another man rests. They thought they were right with God for following rules. And they looked at someone else and said, you must follow the same rules we follow. Strict adherence to Sabbath day, didn't make, to Sabbath day rules didn't make the Pharisees right with God. Listen, the, the religious leaders on this side were simply saying, we're right with God because we do not do this and we do that. And on the other side, you had these religious people that were now walking with Jesus. And they're saying, I don't understand all that they do, but my faith is not found in what I do or don't do, but it's found in Christ. And because my faith is in Christ, I trust in Him. Therefore, my rest is found in Him. When I was in high school, I had a friend of mine whose mother died of cancer. And his dad had one of these jobs that was extremely demanding. He left long before sunrise, and he was not usually home until long after dark. And this friend of mine had a younger brother. Throughout our high school years, I would stay at his house many nights. They gave me a key to their home. Had a toothbrush at their home. Spent many nights there. Would cook breakfast for them. Help clean up, make up the bed. Many days, he would, my friend would cook breakfast, and I would take his brother to school. Then the next time I would cook breakfast and he would take his brother to school because he didn't have a mom and dad there to take care of these things. So I, I saw it as not only he's my friend, but I can help out in this manner. You know, everything the children did, everything that those two boys did, I did. I cleaned the house. I worked in the house. I did these things. I helped. I cleaned. I made the bed. I cooked. I took them to school. But I didn't belong to that family. It didn't matter how much stuff I did. I didn't belong to that family. 
Why? Because I had not been born into that family. My family was at 312 Scenic View Road, not Highway 11 where he lived. Christian, you're not right with God simply because you rest on Sunday. You rest on Sunday because you're right with God. We observe the Sabbath not with legalistic rules. We observe the Sabbath to rest personally and to worship joyfully. But in Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the issue became not what is work. The issue became what is acceptable. Jesus was faced with the issue of should I heal him or not heal him? If I heal him on Saturday and not on Sunday, is that right? If I wait till Monday, does that somehow make it better than if I heal him today? Should I let him die today or should I go ahead and heal him? Should I wait? This was the question on the table. What is acceptable and unacceptable on the Sabbath? Many Christians today still debate over what is and what is not acceptable. If we're honest and humble and biblically conscious this morning, then we will come to one major conclusion. That on Sunday, when we come together for public worship, and we go home to rest, we must offer each other a lot of grace in how that is played out. Not everyone views rest in the same manner. And too many times, we are striving to get people to observe the Sabbath before we've asked them to surrender to Jesus. Too many times, we're trying to get people to observe the Sabbath before they surrender to the cross. You bring people to Jesus and he'll work out all those other details. Don't start with the minor points first. You bring them to Jesus and he'll work out the rest, church. Mark chapter 3, verse 5, it says that Jesus was grieved because of the hardness of their hearts. What made their hearts hard? Their hearts were hardened because they looked at people and said, why don't you act like me? And Jesus said, because I'm not calling people to act like you. I'm calling them to rest in me. So what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable on Sunday? Number one, rest is definitely acceptable. And how you rest may be different than how another man rests. But you need a day to restore your soul, restore your mind, and let your body rest. The second, there's public worship, which is also acceptable. And I would say, which is commanded. That we should not neglect the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But all the more as we see the day of God approaching, we should gather in God's house on the Sabbath to worship together. The Bible doesn't give us a list of times and meetings. We have a lot of grace to figure this out. And God has blessed us here at Mount Vernon to have an early service and a a late service here at 11 and to squeeze our Sunday school in between. And we've been very blessed in this manner. It is my hope that God will continue to bless so that we can have even more people come into our public worship of gatherings so that we can teach more people how to rest in Christ. Religious people of Jesus' day never did understand this. Rest, worship, and grace seemed to always exclude them or bypass them. And they held to the Sabbath as a day of burdensome rules. There's two things in our world today that seem to be at odds with one another, work and rest. I'm almost finished, church. Bear with me. I know a lot of people that want to rest and not work. Y'all know some of them? I know a lot of people that want to work and not rest. I know some of them too. The Bible paints a picture of how the Sabbath should remind us of work and rest. And most Christians have never even considered how the Sabbath, how our Sunday gathering and our Sunday day of rest does two things of how it possibly points us to the Garden of Eden and how it possibly points us to our future heaven. Pastor, I've never once considered the Sabbath day as a day of looking at the Garden of Eden and looking forward to heaven. I just see it as a day to restore my soul before Monday hits. The truth is most people live for Friday at 5 just to dread Monday at 8. I literally wrote this sermon this week. And I literally put that sentence in and a lady walked in. It's like 5 o'clock Friday afternoon, she walked in. 
And I said, how's it going? She said, I am glad this week is over. I said, I just wrote that in my sermon. She said, if you worked where I work and you knew what I knew and you worked around the people I worked around, you'd be glad to come home too. But the Sabbath day points us to the Garden of Eden. How? In Genesis chapter 2, we find Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In perfect, restful paradise, in joyful relationship with God. In perfect communion with God. Everything they could ever want, every amenity they could ever desire, it was there. And then when sin entered the world by their failure to obey God, the Garden of Eden then became work, it became labor, and it became struggle. Prior to Adam and Eve's sin, they experienced the greatest joy of all time, unhindered relationship with God. After their sin, they hid themselves. They blamed each other. They made excuses, and paradise was lost. What does the Garden of Eden have to do with Sabbath or even us as Christians? Our observance of the Sabbath doesn't come from legalistic rules on Sunday. But our observance of the Sabbath reminds us of the restful, worshipful relationship we had with God before sin entered the world. It points us backwards as a reminder That before we broke our relationship with God in sin, we were in restful paradise with God. And we still today need a day of rest to be reminded of what we had. But it's also a foreshadowing of what is to come. It's a reminder of what we had in rest in God, but it's a foreshadowing of the heaven that awaits. Our broken relationship through sin has been restored to us in Christ. And one day we will again receive the reward of our trust in Jesus that gives us worshipful and restful paradise with God. So when you come to church on Sunday, it's not just to hear me. You come to church on Sunday, it's not just to sit in the pew. You come to church on Sunday, it's not just to gather with other people. When you come to church on Sunday, it's a reminder of what we had in God and the rest we had in God. And it's also a foreshadowing of the heaven that is to come. So when you come in here on Sunday morning, guess what, church? It should be a little glimpse of heaven. A little glimpse. And how many times have we rushed in, hurried in, ran in, argued in the car on our way in, how many times have we sit here worried about what is to come tomorrow, thinking about lunch, thinking about all these other things, and our soul never rests in God. If you look at the Garden of Eden, we had rest. And now today we need rest. And one day we will receive it permanently. In conclusion, the Sabbath was given to man for him to worship joyfully and rest peacefully. So I say to you this morning, as we walk out of this building today, as we go our separate ways, I say to you, go enjoy your Sabbath and make sure today sharpens your axe. Let's stand together this morning. Brother Dean, will you go get the kids for us, if you don't mind? It is my challenge to you to walk out of this building today and go enjoy your, day of, your Sabbath day. Thank you for coming to worship together joyfully. Now go rest peacefully. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this day. Lord, our bodies cannot take the non-stop running that we often put it through. Give us a day to recharge. Give us a day to be renewed. Give us a day for our souls, acts, to be sharpened. Thank you, Jesus, for this Sabbath, and help us to honor it well in Jesus' name.